An interesting fact that I just uh, was shared uh, just in the last week is that the, the hospital was actually decommissioned on March 31st, 1996. We're here gathered today almost 20 years to the date of the hospital being closed. So um, that's an interesting fact. I'd like to welcome now Laurie Meyer Dries to talk a little bit about the connection between um, Indian hospitals and residential schools. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm really honored to be here today on this beautiful Treaty 6 territory and I'm very much humbled to be in the presence of so many important people. I'd really like to acknowledge the guests from Cambridge Bay and uh, many and many of others who are here who I haven't met yet. But um, I, I'm just here to share a little bit of work that I've been doing since uh, I was a researcher for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, for the Special Unit on Missing Children. And I had done a little bit of work on the Charles Cancel Indian Hospital prior to that. Uh, my goal today is to broaden our view of the Indian Hospital system, which included the Cancel Hospital. And I really want to invite all of us here to look at these institutions, these Indian hospitals, as part of something within a larger circuit. And I use the word circuit of institutions because there really was a lot of movement within these institutions that overlapped. Um, I, I feature here a picture of the Charles Cancel Indian Hospital, a sketch uh, overlapping with uh, a picture of an Indian residential school, the Brandon Indian Residential School, as a starting point. Um, in my research, I, I came across many intersections between these institutions, and I just wanted to feature some little documents that show snippets of these kinds of connections. In fact, many of you know that there were schools inside the Indian hospitals, and children who were placed there received instructions from teachers and were encouraged to continue their studies. So let's notice that these institutions overlapped. This example here is the Moose Factory Indian Hospital, and in fact here a teacher is advocating for a student to continue school after he was discharged from the hospital. I hope you can read it a little bit anyway. Here is an illustration of students taking classes uh, at the council with the teacher and doing some homework, teacher and pupils. And so we understand that uh, children were receiving lessons in a residential school fashion within the hospital system. Another example of a school system operating within an Indian hospital comes from the Capel Indian Hospital. And this record here is simply a principal's monthly report tallying how many students were in what grade. So these kinds of records are uh, peppered throughout the Indian residential school record set, showing the connection between the institutions. This letter is probably too small for you to read from any distance, but uh, we notice also that Indian residential schools also had hospitals or uh, preventoria or sick wards within them for children who didn't uh, have the ability to be transferred over to a formal Indian hospital. Uh, and that's because, of course, there was uh, such a prevalence of sickness in so many of the schools. In this case, uh, the, the author of the letter is complaining about the closing of the preventoria and closing of these kind of sick wards because uh, they were doing such good work with tuberculosis treatment within the residential schools. So clearly, you know, the, um, the connection between schools and healthcare uh, and Indian hospitals was there. Children also moved from schools to Indian hospitals. And these here are some records that demonstrate children being transferred from the Indian Residential School to, in this case, the Nanaimo Indian Hospital on Vancouver Island, which was the second largest Indian hospital in the Canadian Indian Hospital system. Uh, the lower record shows a student or two being moved to a hospital in Lytton. So children weren't just moved within the Indian Hospital system, but to any kind of healthcare facility back uh, from the schools. Um, children were also moved to residential schools from hospitals. So a child might be ill in the community and then sent to a hospital like the Charles Cancel or like the Nanaimo Indian Hospital. And um, 
from there, uh, uh, that, that was one way of going, but you could be in the hospital and then be transferred to Indian Residential School from the hospital once you entered a state of remission. And many children experience this move from the hospital to a residential school, sometimes without their parents' or family's knowledge. In this case, a, a young child was moved from uh, the Kokolitsa Indian Hospital to uh, a residential school, was admitted there. If the movement could go in one direction, it obviously also went in both ways at the same time for multiple patients. So this last example here, I just wanted to show the moving back and forth between schools to hospital, back to school. So there is this movement, and that's why I say institutional connections with movement. Students weren't just transferred once and then exited to normal family life after that. They went back and forth. And in this instance, it's a, ch uh, a child that's being moved from a school to the Nanaimo Indian Hospital and then to another Indian residential school after that. So the transferring back and forth. This is just a sample of the kind of movement that happened. And this slide isn't very telling here, but what I wanted to illustrate was that the Indian residential schools were in kind of a circuit with the Indian uh, hospital system and also public facilities and also other kinds of public institutions like uh, children's aid societies and juvenile detention and correctional facilities. If you dig deeper into the records, children could be moved from residential school to hospital to foster care or then back to hospital and then somewhere else. In fact, it becomes a kind of a strange and creepy merry-go-round where children were transferred back and forth between these various kinds of institutions only to become lost or missing. And indeed, uh, labor positions were included in that as well. Children were sometimes trained in hospital or in schools to uh, assume a kind of a technical role or a, a labor function and they too could be moved out of their institution into a job, never to connect with their family again after that. So I think we need to be, be aware that the Indian hospital system, including the council, was part of a larger set of connected institutions with this, within our Canadian society that sanctioned the movement of people, often without their consent. And I'm just looking at the time. Um, the issue of consent is very important. After 1945 in Canada, our general Canadian society did agree that it was important for medical treatment and for enrolling children at school that families gain or are given the opportunity to give consent for that kind of um, release of their children. And it becomes apparent from the record set that there was clear disregard for the need to consent uh, need, need to have consent and get consent from families or to inform them of the need for that consent. Sometimes there was deliberate neglect for uh, trying to get consent or there was falsification of consent in the records themselves. And I think this is something that uh, really requires further investigation and I hope that uh, that will be done in the future. And this is how people who have lost loved ones and cannot find where, where they ended up um, need to be able to trace their family members through the record set that moves beyond the individual institutions. And I think the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, with its focus on Indian residential schools as closed units on their own, is really missing an opportunity to see this larger systemic move. Thank you very much.